This video is picking up right where the previous video left off. We are in part 070 underscore loops, and we're scrolling down to timing start. We're going to look at how long it takes to run various uh, different implementations of filling up a matrix with a value. That isn't as important as both learning how to time our code and seeing why, if you can help it, loops actually should be avoided. Not all of this code is going to work in Octave. In particular, the date time function is not going to work in Octave, but I'll show an alternative right at the end of this video. In this first section here, what we're going to do is I'm going to generate a matrix of 4 million ones. I hope I have that math right. 2,000 times 2,000? Pretty sure that's 4 million. So when I say ones parentheses 2,000, this is like saying 2,000 comma 2,000. 2,000 rows, 2,000 columns, all ones. And I'm putting that into a matrix named A. And then I'm going to call a function called date time. And I ask it for right now. I put that result into a variable named start time, and then into a new matrix named B, I put all those ones, but multiplied by pi. Why would I do such a thing? I don't know, but this is what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to put into a variable named elapsed time, the new now, because presumably it took some time to run this, minus the start time. This line of code is very much like me clicking a stopwatch to start it, and then this is like me clicking that stopwatch a second time to see how much time has elapsed. I'm going to display out the elapsed number of seconds using the seconds function, parentheses, elapsed time. And in fact, let's also just go ahead and display out the number of milliseconds that have elapsed. These are both built-in functions, as is date time, as is ones. All right, let's go ahead and run it. All right, so the first time I ran it, I got 0 0.003 elapsed seconds, and that's about three milliseconds to run this code. If you run it again, if I run it again, I will get a different number. So this is pretty close to the same value, but slightly different. If I run it again, I get still a different value. And you will also get a different value. The number you get will be affected both by your computer speed and how many other programs are vying for your processor's attention when you run the program. So if you're running a whole bunch of programs, this number will be larger because it's just how much time has passed. But keep an eye on this number. In fact, you know what? I'll copy it and paste it so that we don't have to remember what it is. Let's scroll on down here. So that was the vectorized timing of that operation. There it is vectorized. And now let's compare to doing the same operation using a for loop. I'm going to create my matrix of 4 million ones. I'm going to start my timer. I'm going to loop through for k equals 1 through the length of my matrix as a column vector, so the entire, as many values as there are in the matrix, and then a new, actually, vector rather than matrix, b at position k, I'm going to put the value from matrix a at position k times pi. So it's actually slightly different from what I did before, but it shouldn't really affect the timing. And then I will stop the timer right here, get the difference between the new current time and the starting time, and display out how many seconds elapsed. Oh yeah, and I actually didn't clear, I didn't do, use a CLC, so we can actually see the old numbers as well. And here's my result right here. And we're comparing to this one. Well, that's the one in seconds. So, I don't know, what is that? It's like almost 100 times slower, or I don't know, maybe 80 times slower, something like that. I don't want to do the math in my head. It's a lot slower. Instead of these two zeros here, we don't have zeros at all. We have significant digits. So dramatically slower with the looped version. You can see the comparison there. For loops are slow. Now, why are they so much slower? Um, I'm not 100% sure, so definitely don't quote me on this, but I'm betting that the implementations of like the multiplication is in probably compiled C code, and who knows, maybe they have special ways of making it fast. Whereas this code right here might have to go through a translation process before it gets to the C code in which MATLAB is implemented. The MATLAB programming language is actually implemented in the C programming language, which is kind of a, a little nice curiosity there. All right, and before we go down to more timing, let me note that start time and elapsed time, like what actual information is in these variables? If you look at the workspace, they look kind of funny. They have like interesting symbols associated with them, and they have different text over here. Well, start time, if we uh, put it over here, it's a date time object, and this is how it displays out. 
So we're not really going to talk about objects in this uh, video series, but objects are basically a bundle of variables and associated functions. And then elapsed time is a duration, which is a slightly different thing. Now, without asking for the number of seconds or even the number of milliseconds, um, it's just displaying hours, minutes, and seconds. And since it's smaller than that, it's not displaying out. But when we say, like, give me the number of seconds or give me the number of milliseconds, then we can actually view what's going on there. All right, continuing on down. In an earlier video, in the for loop video, I believe, I talked about pre-allocation or pre-allocating our matrices or vectors. This code right here is exactly identical to the code in the previous section, except there is additional code right here. There's more code. Now, normally, more code means slower because there's more stuff that has to get done. But this is a, an example, a dramatic example, of where that's not necessarily the case. So in that previous video, I talked about the idea of if you know that you're going to be buying a lot of books, you should build yourself a really big bookshelf to fit all of those books. It would be ridiculous to cut up some wood, nail it together, and have a little bookshelf that's only big enough for the one book that you own. And then when you buy a second book, rip the nails out of the bookshelf, cut the wood again to a bigger size, and make a bookshelf that's only big enough for the two books that you now own. But something similar to that is literally happening in computer memory if you grow a vector one element at a time, as we're doing here. By saying, oh, b is this vector, and let's put it at position 1, a particular value, and then loop through, and then say, oh, at position 2, put another particular value, and then make the computer go run into memory and look for room for two values, copy over the first one, put the second one in, and think it's done, only to be asked to copy all that information over to a location for three values, and then so on, all the way up to 4 million. That's what we were doing in this for loop up here. And in fact, while I'm here, let me run the previous sections so that uh, we can have on the screen, you know, how quick they were for comparison. Okay, so that was vectorized, no loops. This is the one with a loop with no pre-allocation. And then finally down here, what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what? Build a bookshelf big enough for 4 million values, and then we're going to put some values into it. So we're doing extra work, but we're doing it ahead of time to make our work later on more efficient. Let's finally go ahead and run this. And there's our result right there. Now it's not faster than the vectorized version, the version with no loops, but it is like what, at least 10 times faster than the version without pre-allocation. So if you know how big your vector or matrix is eventually going to become, create it at that size and then fill values into it as you calculate them, replacing whatever default values you put in in the first place. Continuing on down. Now, a more convenient timing is the use of tick and talk. And by the way, this does work perfectly in Octave, unlike the date time above. So if all you're interested in is just like, okay, how long does it take to run some code? You can just put TIC all by itself before or when you want to start the timing, right? This is like me clicking the start of my stopwatch. And then you put TOC, T-O-C, at the bottom when you're done timing. So let's run this section. And it will even display out nicely for you. Elapsed time is 0.017 seconds. The only downside of tick and talk is that I'm not sure there's an easy way. I don't know how to do it. There's not an easy way to get this numeric value into a variable. Whereas with the date time examples, I literally have this variable named elapsed time where I put my results. I could create a vector, I could time a whole bunch of things and put a bunch of timings into a vector or write them out to file or do a variety of different things with them. I don't know, I don't think there's an easy way to do that with TikTok, but otherwise it is more convenient. All right, now that's all for the MATLAB timing. Let's briefly go over to Octave and see what we can do in terms of timing over there. All right, first of all, just as before, Tick and Talk work perfectly in Octave as they do in MATLAB. I will warn you, however, Octave is way slower. I'm not exactly sure why that is. MATLAB appears to be dramatically more optimized than Octave is. Yeah, so you know how even without the pre-allocation, even with the really slow running, it took like less than a second? In Octave, it took me over 18 seconds to run this code right here. So that's, that's a yikes uh, from me. Uh, so that's a very unfortunate aspect of the freeware 
uh, Octave. But, you know, the benefit is it's free. All right, and I just Googled Octave, how to convert, how to get the current time and convert to seconds or whatever. And I came upon uh, this web page right here. And I'm looking at this code right here. This looks like it will do something equivalent to what we were doing in MATLAB. So let's go over. I'm going to go to the fast running uh, vectorized version here and hope it doesn't take 18 seconds. And instead of start time equals date time now, what I'm going to do is start time equals clock with nothing in the parentheses. And then for the elapsed time, actually, I'm going to just go ahead and copy this so I don't have to remember it. And then for the elapsed time right here, I'm going to put in, there's a function e time clock, which is basically get the current time. It's like that date time now, and then versus the start time. Now they used t0 as their variable name, and I used start time. Let's go ahead and see if this works. Oh, um, but I needed to change this code here. The seconds function is not implemented in octave. So let me try that again. All right, and there we go. And it tells me that many seconds have elapsed. A very, very, very small number, so it is written in scientific notation, which is perfectly fine, but that does work. So clock, and then e time parentheses, clock again, and then your other variable, the start time, can get you effectively the same result as that date time from MATLAB. So Octave users, you can uh, use that instead. And that's all for this video.